Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Good to see you here this morning. It's a good time to come on in and find a seat. Let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are always good. You always do good. And you would be good all in yourself if you never were to dispense mercy to sinners. And yet we see your goodness combined with love in your forgiveness of our sins. And and at infinite cost by the death of your son at the cross. And so the word grace for us becomes a lifeline. Your grace, your unmerited favor your willingness to declare a righteous status and to transform our lives is undeserved. It is the ground of our boasting. It is our song. It is indeed infinitely and eternally precious to us. We pray this morning as we think about your grace that we would revel in it, that we would be brought low all over again uh, the way immense gifts humble. And we pray to always give you glory for what you have done on our behalf. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love October. October marks a change of seasons. Uh, I, I like the change. I like the change in the weather. Every place I've lived, October was my favorite month. And I just, I love what happens in October. I don't know what you think of, uh, maybe you start singing Christmas songs in October. Um, That's not my favorite. Um, Maybe you put ghouls and goblins and skeletons in your front yard. Um, Our our world does various things with October. I start singing Luther's song. When I think of October, I think of the Reformation. I think of 95 theses nailed to the castle church door in Wittenberg. I think about the the spark of the gospel recovered and the scriptures unburied where they had been under the rubble of a thousand years of medieval compromise and bad theology. I think about those who suffered under the church for proclaiming the sufficiency of God's word or a pure gospel. I love the Reformation period. In fact, for me, October 31st is Reformation Day. Uh, It's celebrated in various forms and fashions, uh, but I can't help think of Luther. And and I love the the words to the song, um, though his craft and power are great, speaking of Satan, and armed with cruel hate, one little word will fell him. What is that word? Above all earthly powers. And we see the the word of God, what Scott Demarest brought to us last week in, in sola scriptura, as that which clarifies our means of salvation. The only way to God, brought about by God's word alone. In equipping hour in October, this happens to be a five Sunday October, which conveniently allows us to herald the five slogans of the Reformation, Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Solus Christus, Soli Deo Gloria. The Scriptures alone, grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. These became almost war cries in a theological sense for the Protestant Reformation. So in a five Sunday October, how could we do otherwise? then walk through the five solas of the Reformation. So that's what this Equipping Hour series is about. Uh, This morning, uh, I would put before you sola gratia or grace alone. Grace is our topic, and grace alone specifically is our topic this morning. And you need to know something about the Reformation. The Reformation was a recovery to the original, not a development of something new. When we talk about the Protestant Reformation, we're not talking about the evolutionary development of religious ideas. We're not talking about the the enlightenment bringing in the height of humanism and a bunch of new ideas and innovations. In the Protestant Reformation, we're talking about the rediscovery of what had been lost and buried. 
but even then not lost and buried totally. It's not as if no one believed the gospel since the time of the apostles to 1517. No, in fact, there were many who believed the gospel, who knew the gospel, who had been saved by the gospel. There were many who believed in the scriptures alone as authoritative, who believed in grace alone for salvation, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and held to the no boasting clause of the New Testament, glory be to God alone. There were many. They just weren't a part of the official church, east or west. And so they were on the run. Uh, they, they didn't get government subsidies. Uh, they were hunted down, many times killed. Uh, but they were there. In, in his helpful book, Long Before Luther, Nathan Busnitz has documented for us a long line of faithful ones who heralded these five solas of the Reformation, even using the phrases, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and the scriptures alone, long before Luther nailed 95 theses to the door. So the Reformation was not something new, particularly, nor had the truths that were rediscovered and highly published during the Reformation, nor were they altogether lost. There were those who were faithful throughout history. In fact, from the time of the apostles through the church fathers to the medieval period, all the way up to the pre-Reformation reformers, the, the names you might know, Peter Lombard, John Wycliffe, John Huss. Those who predated Luther who held to these same truths and were martyred for it. Let's ask this morning, why is sola such an important word? Why is sola important? Why, why should we say the scriptures alone? Can't we just say scriptures, Jesus, faith, grace, glory to God? Why the word alone? Why is this so critical? Because scripture plus destroys the scriptures. If you add material that is authoritative to the Bible, you water down the Bible. You actually take away the Bible. The Bible is to be the sole authority for truth, for Christian life. When you add to it, you actually take away. So the Roman Catholic Magisterium, we were speaking about this a month ago or so in our Speaking for God series, the Catholic Magisterium, which added popes and councils and creeds and church tradition and the secret council of bishops who held on to the things that the apostles said but never told anybody, but we've got them and we're ready to dispense them whenever church history demands it. All of those additional things are not helpful to the Bible. They actually take away from God's truth. They drown out God's voice. And you know this is true from the world's religions and from personal experience. Anytime we believe that, yes, the Bible is God's word, but I also have this other thing. The also have this other thing usually gets the louder voice. It usually, in practice, becomes the authority, becomes the thing we depend upon. So scripture plus actually subtracts from the scripture. Grace plus eliminates grace. Grace plus merit. Merit is the opposite. Grace is just the word for gift. It means something which is freely given. God's grace is free in the sense that God is free to dispense it. And the sinner who encounters God's grace does so at zero cost to himself in the dispensing of it. We'll also look this morning at what grace does in a life to transform. But when you add merit to grace, something I bring to the table, you actually destroy grace. Grace alone is critical. Because no one who has experienced God's grace has experienced it because they were smarter, better, more noble, more privileged, or, or for any other reason, hereditary, experiential, intelligence, none of it matters. God's grace comes to those whom he chooses based on no merit of our own. Grace plus merit destroys grace. Christ plus anything destroys Christ. 
Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. If you say that and say, oh, you know, eternal life is like a wagon wheel and all spokes lead to the hub, and it doesn't matter which spoke you're on, as long as you're sincere, it all gets us to the same place in the end. Christ is great for you, Buddha is great for me. Actually destroys Christ. And Christ, plus any of those other things, destroys Christ. Christ lays claim to the soul of man as soul mediator, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and is jealous for his unique place. He will have no rivals. And he couldn't have any rivals. Who competes with Christ in terms of a savior? None. At infinite proportions, there is no comparison. Christ plus anyone or anything else destroys Christ. And we'll get into that next week. We'll, we'll talk about it, particularly in the medieval period at the time of the Reformation, uh, for the church, they said, oh yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they also said, relics and Mary and the mass and fill in the blank, all kinds of things. When we talk about grace and grace alone, we don't mean grace infused by some mechanical or religious procedure. We don't mean grace dispensed by some priest doing the thing that the priest does. We mean God's grace that comes solely through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Faith plus anything destroys faith. This is the argument from Romans and Ephesians. You can't add works to faith as if faith that pleases God must be supplemented by the things that you do. Ben James will be talking about that one. And then glory to God plus anything. Glory to God plus a little bit of glory for me. Glory to God plus a little bit of honor for the things that I've done. Uh, boasting in Christ and a little bit of self-promotion destroys glory to God. God will have no rivals. He says in, in Isaiah, I will not share my glory with another. That is his intrinsic glory, his intrinsic value, his intrinsic worth, the sum total of all of his attributes and who he is, the, the radiating brilliance of all that God is and the weightiness of his character, he will not share. Nobody gets to take credit. This is why you have, when the gospel is explained and grace is explained and faith is explained in the scriptures, it often comes with this tag, so that no man may boast. That is the great no boasting clause of the New Testament. God will not share his glory for salvation. So alone, the word alone in these is very important. Scripture plus anything destroys scripture. Grace plus anything destroys grace. Christ plus anyone or anything destroys Christ. Faith plus anything destroys faith. And God's glory plus glory to anyone else destroys the doxology, uh, that glory which is properly reserved for God. Grace alone, of course, is important to the New Testament. You notice how many of the letters of the New Testament begin with grace to you, or grace and peace to you, or grace, mercy, and peace to you. Uh, those aren't throwaway words. That, that is the plea of the apostle that his readers would experience God's grace. It's something of a prayer as an introduction to a letter. And turn to Romans chapter 3. We're just going to trace out the importance of grace in a little bit of Paul's argument here. In Romans chapter 1, we discover that the Gentiles are really bad people. In Romans chapter 2, we discover that the Jews and the religious are really bad people. And in case we miss the point in chapter 1 or chapter 2, by the time you get to Romans 3, you discover that everybody's really bad people. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And when we get to verse 21 of Romans chapter 3, um, we get the, the positive good news introduced. It's all been bad news up to, up to uh, verse 20 of chapter 3, three chapters of bad news. Um, and everybody's sinned and works of law and flesh uh, will not make anybody right before God. So we're all in trouble. Everybody's failed and there's nothing you, do, you can do to make up for it. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for the letter, Paul. But the, the story turns at Romans 3.21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or made known. 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even that righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all, and I think the all here is the all who believe in verse 22, they all have sinned, they all fall short of God's glory, and are justified, verse 24, as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And you see the piling up of soteriological vocabulary here. I mean, the, the words related to salvation. Uh, justified, that is a declaration of righteousness, a forensic declaration, a, a law courtroom statement from God in heaven to all the universe that a sinner is put forth as just or right in God's accounting. As if that sinner has never done anything wrong and as if that sinner has always done everything right. That's what justification means. And then gift by His grace, uh, two words saying the same thing, a, a doubled up pile of undeserved favor. Uh, you, you, if if it's somebody gives you a gift, it's by definition not earned. <laughs> And in order to make it clear, Paul says it twice, a gift by His grace. Where does this come? Through the redemption, a purchase out of the slave market of those sinners enslaved to sin. And it only comes in Messiah Jesus. What did God do? Verse 25, He displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation. Another big word. That is a satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. In other words, God is very angry about our sin, all the way back to Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Religious ones, irreligious ones. Gentiles, Jews. Rank pagans and the morally upright. All of them, God's angry with. And propitiation means that God's anger goes away. It is satisfied it is absorbed so that there is none left. And how does that happen? In the blood of Jesus, verse 25. In other words, Jesus' death was not a martyr's death, not a victim's death. It was a substitutionary sacrifice in the place of sinners. It was an exchange. Jesus died the death that we deserved. He paid the debt that we owed. And his blood expunges and absorbs totally God's anger against our crimes. It's remarkable. This is all of God. And this comes to us, verse 25, through faith. In other words, okay, what do I, God, what do I need to do to get that propitiation? What do I need to do to get that redemption? How can I be justified? This is the great question that every human being must answer. How do I, the sinner, stand before a holy God and not be incinerated for my sins if God is to keep his reputation as holy and good and just and right? I mean, God could be a bad judge and just let bygones be bygones and justice be darned. But God is good and he's righteous and he's holy. What hope do I have? This is the great question. This was the great question that fueled the Protestant Reformation. This is the great question, the question of a burdened conscience and awareness of a holy God that drove Martin Luther insane. He kept going to the confessional booth and saying, I've sinned, Father, and goes through the whole deal. Walks out of the booth and said, I think I sinned in my confession. I need to go back. And eventually his, his confessional priest said, Luther, stop coming in here. I've got other work to do. His was a burdened conscience that no manner of confessions or penances or uh, kissing the steps on his knees in Rome, uh, step by step by step up St. Peter's Basilica, none of those works could satisfy his burdened conscience. In fact, Luther believed the righteousness of God was not good because he was bad. Luther was bad. How could the righteousness of God be good for me? It was a, an unbridgeable gap. It was an unreachable standard. And we have here in Romans 3 how God does this. He says in verse 25, this propitiation through the blood of Jesus that comes through faith is to demonstrate God's righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he passed over sins previously committed. The demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that God would be just and the justifier of those who believe. 
In other words, God gets to maintain his reputation as just and righteous, not lowering his standard. And he can put forth someone as just who wasn't. Listen, this is the only hope for a sinner. It's not fair in one sense, right? It's not fair that we don't get what we deserve. And it certainly isn't fair that Christ the righteous got what we deserved and didn't get what he deserved. But it is our only hope. And this is the provision God has made, and so we cling to it. This is grace. It leads in verse 27 to that no boasting clause. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Why? Because you didn't work for it. You simply believed. Verse 28. So this is obviously critical. Look down at chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, excuse me, 4-4. Four, four. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due. Favor there is karen or charis. It's the, it's the word for gift. It's the word for grace. You can write grace right in there in that word favor in verse 4. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as grace, but what is due. Do you understand the dilemma? Grace and merit are mutually exclusive. You can't say, I got to heaven by what I did. God looked at me and said, yep, Nice try, good job, close enough. <laughs> because what happens when you get to heaven if salvation is based on merit? You, you punched in your time clock, your, your time card. I don't know if anybody uses time clocks anymore. I, I used to have a job where I had a time card with my name on it. I put it in the, in the clock, punch, and it would stamp the time I started work, and then I did it again at lunch, and then after lunch, and then at the end of the day, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And it told my employer exactly how many minutes I was clocked in. Didn't tell him how many minutes I worked. But it told him how many minutes I had clocked in. And then what was given to me at the end of two weeks? Grace. Here's 58 bucks for working at Michael's in the frame shop. It wasn't grace. It's what was owed me. It's what was due. It was what was agreed upon. And what's on your time card for your life under the sun? Merit, merit, righteousness, good intentions, good doing. Not before God. Your time card is full of liabilities, deficiencies, and crimes. Listen, sometimes your best is just not good enough. Our best efforts are a liability before God. What fills the time card? Sin and more sin and more sin. And on top of all of that sin, the rejection of grace if you're leaning on merit. This is the great tragedy of human religion, of, of merit as opposed to grace, or grace plus merit. Any, any sort of way that humans like to smuggle in their own doings into justification. It is a statement to God who has provided His Son as our substitute to finish the work of redemption and propitiation and salvation. And we say, that's all right, God, I got this. Hey, look what I've done. See my time card? Do you remember what Paul says about his time card in Philippians 3? And he gave the whole list. I mean, he read off his time card. Uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a tribe of Benjamin. I mean, all the, the pedigree, the lineage in terms of the, the works of the law, blameless before men. I mean, he had lived it out as well as anyone could. And he called it a stinking pile of refuse. And that's what our good works are. They, they stink to high heaven, the best of them. And so in addition to a time card full of sin, the one who trusts his own merit holds up to God that time card full of sin plus all of his so-called merit, which is more sin, at the same time, he's rejecting God's gracious provision of a substitute that actually paid for sin. It is a double rejection. 
It's a rejection of God's indictment of human depravity, and it's a rejection of God's solution. God will not accept such things. But to the one, Romans 4, 5, who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. What a remarkable statement. God justifies the ungodly. And and Ben James in a couple weeks is gonna talk about the relationship of faith to that exchange. Uh, But this is all of grace. It's opposed fundamentally to merit, to earning. Turn to Romans 11. Verse six. Speaking of the remnant of Jews who were saved in his time, Paul says, if their salvation is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Do you understand? These are mutually exclusive. You can't have a little bit of grace and a little bit of works mixed in together on your time card. (laughs) to, To believe in Jesus is to reject your time card altogether to see it as a pile of refuse and to get Christ's time card in your place. That's what you need. Look at Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that is, having been declared righteous on the basis of faith, we possess peace with God. If you're in Jesus, if you have believed in Christ's finished work at the cross, if you have experienced God's saving grace, you actually now possess peace with him. What does that imply? There was hostility. You were at enmity. It was a world war between you and God. God was angry with you, and you were at enmity with him. And you might have had the trappings of religiosity. You might, by the world's standards, have looked clean, but you were in hostility. While you were dead in your transgressions of sins, unable to extricate yourself from your slavery and your death, God did something unbelievable. Verse six, while we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse eight, God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Verse nine, he saved us from God's wrath through his blood. And notice what Paul says in Romans 5, 2. Through Jesus Christ, we have obtained our introduction by faith into what? Grace. Through Jesus Christ, by faith, believing in his death, you get an introduction into a realm, a a reign, a, a, a tyranny, if you will, that Paul calls grace. It is an environment that envelops the believer's life. We experience grace upon grace from the Lord. Unmerited kindnesses, things we don't deserve every day of the Christian life. From the day you get saved to the day you go to be with him, it is special grace upon special grace. All the world benefits from common graces. God is kind to people who don't give a rip about him. But in salvation, you get introduced into a grace in which you now Stand, not cower. <laughs> it's amazing. We stand in grace. You, you are in good, fitting, good footing with confidence before the Lord. Why? Because you weren't depending on your own merits. How could someone have confidence before the Lord? How could someone stand on their merits? Listen, you blew it this morning, you're gonna blow it this afternoon, you'll fail again tomorrow. <laughs> That kind of living produces what we saw in the life of Martin Luther. I'm gonna go confess my sins. I know I'm guilty before the Lord. My conscience is burning. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna come back again. And unsettled so much that Luther cursed the righteousness of God. He said, God, you are not good. (laughs) Your righteousness is my enemy. I have no recourse. But salvation by grace alone puts you in good standing with God. And the day you got saved was an introduction into grace. Look down at the end of the chapter. 
Law came in so that the transgression would increase. Um, what does that mean? We're all sinners by nature and by activity. But any time a rule comes in, generically or specifically any of God's laws, law does not have the ability to fix the problem. Right? If, if you're like me, and you see the, the freshly planted grass, and you see the sign in the grass on a post that says, do not walk on the grass. Who put that sign there? How dare they? Of course, I didn't, wasn't even thinking about walking on the grass before, but now I'm going to. I'm going to take that sign and snap it over my leg while I walk on the grass. Who can tell me I can't walk on the grass? I'll show them. Was there any problem with the sign? The sign was fine. The sign was good. It was clear. But the law aggravates sin in the heart. Why? Because of the sinfulness of sin, Romans 7. Because of the sinfulness of my own heart, I'm angry at the law that tells me what the standard is. What is the law able to do? Law is able to tell you what the standard is, tell you that you've broken it. I'm sorry, I said it, I left one out. Law is able to tell you what the standard is, aggravate you unto breaking it, and then condemn you for having broken it. Law doesn't have the ability to save you from it. By the way, once you break the law, what are you? A lawbreaker. <laughs> you have transgressed. You now stand as a transgressor. What remedy is there for that? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I won't snap the sign over my leg anymore. It, it's already broken and sitting on the ground. The, the little seedlings are smashed. It's too late. <laughs> lawbreaker. And the law will tell you that. Uh, this is why no system of merit can ever get you to God. It will only condemn you. Let's talk about what grace is for a moment. Grace is a misunderstood word, grievously misunderstood. We tend to think of grace sometimes as a disposition, kind of an attitude. Uh, let bygones be bygones. Oh, give them grace. This isn't what grace is. Grace is not leniency. Grace is not a lowering of the standard. Again, grace, the word gift it just means you get something you don't deserve and couldn't earn. Grace, we'll talk about it in two categories, is forensic justification and life transformation. Grace, the grace of God in the gospel, is forensic justification and life transformation. You weren't looking for either one of those. You couldn't procure either one of those. You couldn't bring either one of those about. They are gifts of God's grace. Superabounding. They overruled your sin. They overruled God's judgments against your sin. By forensic justification, we mean an unchangeable status. An unchangeable status of believers by God. This is where God puts someone forward as righteous. When we talk about uh, how is man justified before a holy God, it means God is willing to put the ungodly, Romans 4, 5, forward as godly, as perfect, as having always met the standard, never broken it. It means that your sins went somewhere. They, they went to the cross and got paid for totally, and they're removed as far as the east is from the west. That which is scarlet has been made white as snow, white as wool. It, it means the sins are gone and forgotten and remembered no more. To be declared righteous in heaven means the status can never change. It is an inviolable declaration by God in his courtroom of not guilty, but not just not guilty, but also positively righteous. And it stands forever. That is forensic justification. It's not leniency. God didn't lower the standard for that. God didn't make salvation something that you could attain by your own efforts. So let me just put it down there, the cookies on the bottom shelf for those poor rug rats. No, God left the standard right where it was and he met the standard himself in the blood of his son. And grace, this reign in which we now stand is, is not just forensic justification, it is also life transformation. Grace, God's unmerited gift, results in change-making power. 
change-making power, the change-making power of God in believers. Justification is the unchangeable status of believers before God, but life transformation is the change-making power of God in believers. Look down at the end of Romans 5. Just as sin reigned in death. Now the word reign there is just the verb form of the word king. Sin dominated or, or kinged in the realm of death. And just as sin's tyranny was awful and total and universal and inescapable, even so, grace reigns or kings or dominates through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we talk about grace being alone, um, it's important to recognize that grace is not alone in the sense of the only thing that happens to you in salvation is that you get forgiven. That's not the only thing grace does. Grace also transforms. Titus tells us that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. The reign of grace in Romans 5 means a new tyranny, a new, and that's a good tyranny, a new slavery, if you will. It's contrasted with the slavery to sin in Romans 6. We've been set free Listen, when you were free from the reign of grace, you were a slave of sin. Now you've been set free from sin and you're a slave of righteousness. What does that? Grace does that. So it's important to recognize when we say uh, we believe that we are saved by grace alone, a lot of the reformers came along and said, but grace that saves isn't alone. In other words, the grace of God in life transformation actually produces a transformed life. And so there will be good works. In fact, for the first time, works that God produces. You know the classic verses on God's grace. Salvation by grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You can turn there and look at it with your eyes. You can rehearse it in your heart. I will read it out loud. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. There it is again, grace and gift. Not as a result of works. Why, verse nine? No boasting clause. So that no one may boast. For, verse 10 is connected to eight and nine, we are his workmanship. In other words, God doesn't just wipe the slate clean and move on. He works on us. We are created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Wait, 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 I thought verse nine said there's no works. No, no, no. You didn't have any. You have nothing that could merit God's favor. You had nothing that could bring about salvation, but God has things, and you're gonna walk in them. Verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Someone who has been justified forensically by God's saving grace is also transformed to live according to the reign of grace in his life, producing works that please God. Grace is not just an attitude. You know, people will say sometimes or, or, or think or just sort of give this idea, I praise the Lord for grace because nobody's perfect. Maybe you hear that when you're sharing the gospel with people. Hey, you need God's grace. Yeah, we all need God's grace. Nobody's perfect. Um, that gives the idea that, well, people are sincere and they try hard, but nobody quite makes it, but grace fills in the gap. We've already seen that grace and, and human effort are mutually exclusive. In fact, you, you can't hold on to human effort and actually experience grace. Grace is God's power exercised in undeserved kindness. That is, sinners don't get what we deserve. You can't earn grace. There's no one good enough to be beyond the need of grace to save. And grace alone in totality. And also you can't out -sin grace. There's nobody so bad as to be beyond the reach of God's grace. Why is grace alone so important? Because first of all, I will, I will give you here four reasons why grace alone is so critical. Now, we had 41 minutes of introduction. Here we go. Here's an outline. Finally, why is grace alone so important? Number one, because grace 
plus underestimates depravity. Grace plus underestimates depravity. It disagrees with God's assessment of the human condition. It disagrees with God's assessment of human ability. When God says sinners apart from grace are dead in their transgressions and sins, ask the next question. So uh, what must a dead man do to become alive? He he can't do anything. That's the point. He's dead. He, He must be rescued from his condition. How can a slave get out of slavery? He's got to be rescued. He's got to be purchased out. The human inability is the Bible's assessment of man. Grace plus merit disagrees with that assessment. It says, no, I have something to offer. God, I'll meet you halfway. I'll get there. Listen, my halfway is in the wrong direction. It doesn't get me any closer to God, but every attempt gets me farther away. And it lowers the standard to, to have grace plus merit, um, it, it means that God sort of meets us where we're at. It, it makes grace leniency on the basis of sincerity. You know, just try hard. God understands. To, to recognize that, that this was absolutely antithetical to the gospel long before the Reformation and long after the apostles, listen to Bernard of Clairvaux. He wrote in the early 1100s. What can all our righteousness be before God? Shall it not, according to the prophet, be viewed as a filthy rag? He's quoting Isaiah 64, 6. And if it be strictly judged, shall not all our righteousness turn out to be mere unrighteousness and deficiency? What then shall it be concerning our sins, when even our righteousness itself can't answer for itself? For what could man, the slave of sin, fast bound by the devil, do for himself to recover that righteousness which he had lost? Therefore, he who lacked righteousness had to have another's righteousness imputed to him. That's the answer. That's the gospel. We have to have an an outside righteousness, an alien righteousness. And grace plus merit undermines depravity, lowers the standard, and removes from us the gospel. Secondly, grace plus is no grace at all. Grace plus is no grace at all. We saw that in Romans already. You you can't have grace, Romans 11, 6, and works. Because if there's works involved, grace is no longer grace. It's a gift or it's not. If it's owed you, it's a wage and it is earned. And what have we earned? Only judgment. Grace alone is so important, thirdly, because grace plus cannot provide salvation. Look at Romans 4.16. Grace plus cannot provide salvation. Paul writes, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be accordance with grace. So there's a relationship between faith alone and grace alone. So that, notice this, that the promise will be guaranteed. Listen, you, you cannot have the promise of salvation guaranteed if it is not grace alone. Again, if it's dependent on your merit, um, who could guarantee that but you? <laughs> that you would keep the standard today and tomorrow and the next day perfectly forever and ever. You're the only one who could make that promise and you can't keep it. <laughs> but God can keep his promise to actually save those who believe only if it is all of grace. Grace alone secures salvation, guarantees salvation. Grace plus cannot do that. Fourthly, grace alone is so important because grace plus makes the cross of Christ worthless and shameful. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Look down at verse 21. Paul writes, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through law, then Christ died needlessly. Okay, there's a little bit of a logical argument, a syllogism here. Christ died needlessly. I think about the end of the Civil War, 
Um, af- after the battles had essentially been fought and there were a few skirmishes here and there and, and men died in those skirmishes after the outcome was secure. I think about the last few kamikaze pilots that flew for Japan. They, they had a one-way trip with an airplane full of bombs and, and enough gas only to get to a target. It was a suicide mission. And, and after the outcome of the war was settled, they, they still got in their planes in worship of the emperor for the glory of the Japanese empire that was now in total defeat and crashed themselves into sea and land. What a waste. Can you think of anything more tragic than a death in vain? And here in Galatians 2.21, Paul says something quite shocking. Jesus died needlessly. Jesus died unto emptiness. Jesus died for nothing. Jesus died in vain. (laughs) May it never be. We're supposed to read that phrase and be shocked and say, No, (laughs) Jesus didn't die in vain. You think about those who gave themselves up for lost causes. That was not Christ. Again, he was not a martyr, was not a victim, was not an example. He was a ransom, a substitutionary sacrifice. He got what he came for. He did not die in vain. So let's work the logical argument backwards. Christ Jesus did not die needlessly. Therefore, righteousness does not come through law. Do you understand it? If righteousness comes through law, Jesus died for nothing. Jesus did not die for nothing, therefore righteousness does not come through law, and therefore we don't nullify grace. Okay, if Jesus died for for nothing, righteousness comes from law, then there is no grace. Grace goes away. Again, grace and merit are mutually exclusive. You either earn your way to salvation or God does it. John MacArthur famously said there are only two religions in the world. The religion of human achievement or divine accomplishment. Those don't go together. You can't mix them. And Galatians 2.21 says this in a shocking way. (laughs) If you smuggle in merit... You nullify grace and you say Jesus died for nothing. Jesus didn't die for nothing. God demands perfection and we can only have it through Jesus. This verse tells us, first of all, to remember the standard that God requires. What is God's standard? Righteousness. You see it right there in the middle of the verse. He demands absolute perfection. He he demands from those who would stand in his glorious and righteous presence that they had always done everything right and never done anything wrong. It's too late for us. We've already broken it. James 2.10 says that one breach of the law means you break the whole law. You become a lawbreaker by definition. And there's no remedy. What can a lawbreaker do to fix the law? You, You can't make up for it. Our relative good is filthy rags. There's no one righteous, no one who does good. When we understand God's absolute standard of righteousness, that leads us to consider the work Christ accomplished. See that in the verse, Christ died. Think about what it means that Messiah died. The the, the author of life, the prince of life, experienced death. This is what God planned before the foundation of the world. It's what he pictured in the sacrificial system. It's what he predicted in prophecy in the Old Testament. Even the political situation that God ordained in the Roman Empire at the time of Messiah's first coming was specially planned by him. The Romans practiced crucifixion, an awful, horrible form of torture and humiliation. And they crucified thousands of people, sometimes thousands at a time. And a a criminal, Roman citizens were exempt, but anybody the Roman Empire wanted to put under their thumb and make as an example to the watching world, don't mess with Rome, they would drive spikes through the wrists and the feet and and, and tie one up or or, uh, hold them up by those spikes to wooden beams till they bled out or couldn't breathe anymore. Awful, excruciating death. And this for the one who never sinned. 
for the righteous one. And, and Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. It wasn't the Romans or the Jewish leadership or the angry mob, ultimately. But it was his father who was pleased to crush him, Isaiah 53. And Jesus who was obedient and laid down his own life, John 10. Ah, he did it for nothing. I got this, God. <clears throat> Look at all the stuff I've done. Look at the good works I've accomplished. I'm not as bad as the next guy. Think of all the things I haven't done. That is reprehensible. We are liars, thieves, adulterers, murderers, rebels, religious hypocrites. And Jesus took all of it on himself. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you think you could be accepted before God by any means other than the cross, do you think God would have sent his son? That's the point of the argument. If righteousness comes by law, then Christ died needlessly. If, if you could get there, if you could meet some standard, if you could do enough religious ceremony, if you could be good enough, if you could read your Bible enough, if you could, if you could, if you could, why would God have crushed his son? Why would Jesus have laid down his life? Very clearly, Jesus said, I lay down my life for my sheep in the place of. To purchase them with his blood for God. To smuggle in merit. To tolerate human religion. Is to say Jesus died for nothing. Of course, we'll have none of that. Paul would have none of that. To say that Jesus died for nothing, to say that I could get to heaven by something I do, nullifies grace, demolishes grace, brings grace to nothing. And so we have to embrace the grace of God found only at the cross. The grace that justifies us brings us into a realm of grace. Just to go back to Romans 5 and think about this precious phrase. Having been justified with God by faith, we have peace with him, and we have our introduction into the grace in which we now stand. This same grace will not let you go because it is the power of God. <laughs> it's not leniency, it's not just an attitude, it's not just a wink wink at bygones being bygones. This is the actual power of God and love of God and free gift of God to forgive and to transform and to sustain and to keep so that you will stand blameless before him with great joy, Jude 24 and 25. It never ends for those who are in Christ. Grace alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your grace. We thank you. We worship you. We love you. Our gratitude is weak. Our faith is feeble. Our worship is lame in comparison to what you deserve for all of your love. You initiated you sought us out when we were running from you. You brought us to yourself in your kindness. You forgave our sins. You have been transforming our lives and you secure us forever. How could we do anything except just live lives of gratitude and worship to you? Help us to live in a way that pleases you under this reign of your grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.